Well, thank you very much for uh, having us at the conference. I will first of all apologize for not having a suit coat. I uh, caught a plane out of Vancouver just after five o'clock yesterday morning, and it's in the back seat of my car. So uh, I'm here in New York without that, and it seems to be going over reasonably well with the bankers I've talked to so far. normal disclaimer and I'm not going to go through that but what I would like to do is talk to you about the strategy of the company and how we plan on moving this corporation forward. Um, first of all I'm almost 62 years old and I'm too old to be shot at on my way to work so we're looking for very safe mining jurisdictions so we're in the state of Alaska and we're in the state of Utah obviously we understand the, la uh, the law of the land and both of those states are very mine friendly states. Uh, secondly we're looking for very high grade deposits we didn't want to be reliant on one metal, uh, so we're going to be talking to you today about silver, lead, zinc, copper, and gold. Um, and again, we were looking for projects that had tremendous amount of scope. Uh, our model is slightly different than the other people have been presenting today. Um, I don't have a desire to be a producer, but I do have a desire to sell our assets to much larger corporations. Management. Uh, is, is really about people, uh, and so are these projects. You know, it's access to capital. I've had the good fortune in my career of raising over $5 billion, so I know how to access the capital markets. Um, it's about hiring good managers and obviously having good solid projects. We think boards of directors are critical as you move companies forward, and you'll see that we have quite a large board. Um, the reason we have that is that we do expect M&A activity as we move forward. And uh, we have three investment bankers on our board. Mark Bloom is a fund manager out of Singapore. We also have shareholders in Europe. And Manfred Char used to be Deutsche Bank, Southeast Asia. Peter Legault, and a retired investment banker from Toronto. Uh, we have two geos currently on our board. Uh, Stuart Jackson used to head up Cominco's exploration on a global basis. Uh, left there and went and ran Houston Oil and Minerals. Uh, we've also just added uh, John Mears from Sentient Group, who's their chief geologist, to our board. And we also have David Lajax, more of a grassroots geologist. Um, we think it's important you can also be politically connected. And I can tell you, for example, in the state of Utah, uh, we're in Mormon country. Um, Brigham Young brought the Mormons to Utah. Sherman Young's great-great-grandfather was his brother. Matter of fact, we sat with the governor last Friday. In Alaska, slightly differently, Willie Hemsley sits on our board. And land settlements have all been done in the state of Alaska. They were done in the 70s. Willie got the native groups in Alaska a uh, billion dollars cash and 44 million acres of land. Uh, he also started the Nanocorp, which is the regional corporation that uh, Nova Copper ourselves and Tech are involved in. Uh, my management team are extremely experienced. Kent Turner, 30 years um, with Cominco, master's degrees. As a matter of fact, he and uh, Rick Van Neuenhaus, the uh, president of Nova Copper went to university together and finished their master's degrees together. Uh, Brad Peake oversees our operations in Alaska. He came out of Kennecott uh, and Houston Oil and Minerals, um, master's degree from Fairbanks. Mike Carter was the COO of Alamos Gold. He also ran a Coeur d'Alene mine and an Oxy Peat mine. So again, an experienced management team. Um, I always think it's important when you're looking at executives of what type of skin in the game do they have. And my family has an excess of 16, probably closer to $18 million invested in this company. So we certainly have our money where our mouth is, and we think that that will help us progress this company quite, uh, quite quickly. We have close to 34 million shares. Uh, Sentient, which is a private equity fund, uh, specializing in this space, their last fund, the fourth one that they just closed, is $1.2 billion. They're sitting on large, large amounts of capital. They make strategic investments. They do not make a lot of them. They currently hold 12% of our company. They have acquired some of those shares out of the market. I'm going to talk to you today about two projects, one in the state of Alaska and one in uh, Utah. The Alaska project is in the Ambler Mining District. I'm sure you're well aware of Nova Copper and their spin out recently from Nova Gold. Uh, they're also in our district. And uh, we will also talk about our strategic holdings in Utah. First of all, let's take a quick look at Alaska. You know, the real problem in Alaska has been access. Um, roads are not uh, prevalent in the state. The roads basically run from Anchorage to Fairbanks and up to Prudhoe. However, the state has uh, a slight issue at this point in time, and that issue is polar bear reserve. 
we've made the brilliant decisions in the United States uh, not to develop our resources, but rather send troops abroad to try to protect resources in other countries. So oil from the North Slope that used to run at about 2 million barrels a day is down to 550 million bar uh, 550,000 barrels a day. Another 10% decline in that pipeline no longer works. So what the governor's been doing is he's been looking for other ways to create revenue for the state. The first uh, project was Red Dog. It's a project that currently is 25% owned by the Nanocorp, uh, soon over the next four or five years to be 50%. The other percentage is owned by Tech Corporation. That is the largest uh, zinc mine in the world. It produces approximately 73% of U.S. zinc. And that private-public partnership was a road and a port put in by the state, which eventually is paid for by the corporations. And as luck would have it, uh, the state is currently looking at other access projects into mineral resources in Alaska, and our district is the second one that they're looking at. So remember, there's some very rich projects in Alaska, Donlin Creek being one, Pebble being another, but they're looking at this district, and I think that's some indication of how the state uh, thinks that this district will look down the road. We have very large land holdings. Uh, our Alaska project is a VMS-type deposit. Um, those are volcanic massive sulfides, essentially a vent uh, from the ocean floor and then a blanket of silver, lead, zinc, and copper were laid on the ocean floor. Our land holdings are twofold. One, about 37,000 acres at the east side of the district. And on the west side of the district, we have about 9,000 acres that used to be tech ground uh, that was lost uh, through mistakes in filings. Uh, the quick map here will show you the main deposits. The Arctic deposit is the largest. That's Nova Copper's main asset. That is 27 million tons. Uh, their agreement with the NANA has the NANA the right to back in for 25%, so it makes it, from NOVA's perspective, about a 20 million ton deposit. Our deposit is estimated to be 20 million tons by a pre-fees done by Anaconda back in the late 70s and early 80s, and the smallest of the deposit is Tech's deposit. It's called the Schmucker. Just a quick slide showing you the development of this. Uh, the discoveries were only done in the late 60s, early 70s, so this is a reasonably new district. And uh, we acquired it uh, through the court systems uh, after North Star uh, was liquidated. So uh, it gave us an opportunity to get in the district. The district has um, the Brooks Range basically running east-west with a series of valleys running off of the Brooks Range. And when I say range, caribou migrate over this. It's not like the Rocky Mountains. This is, is, is uh, much gentler sloping and you can hike up over top of the ranges. And we currently have only focused on one valley. So the three known VMS deposits we have are only in one valley. Uh, and that's what this map shows. It's the main sun deposit, the southwest sun deposit, and Picnic Creek. Um, just a, a quick picture of, of what we're planning on doing this year. Um, our drill plan and focus is on the main sun and the southwest sun. And we have hired Mine Development Associates to come out with a new PEA or preliminary economic assessment on this deposit. Uh, that will be done um, probably in the early 2013 timeframe. We have all the money in the bank for our drill programs this year, so we're not looking for capital. But uh, we expect that you'll be seeing around 20 million tons of just above 6% copper equivalent. So that's the kind of resource you'll be seeing here. Uh, just to put that in terms of uh, of a gold deposit, that's almost a six million ounce gold deposit. So to give you some idea of the size and scope of this and, uh, and uh, billions of pounds of copper equivalent. So just to give you an idea of what, what the size and scope of this is. We also will be doing a bunch of exploratory drilling because we've looked over 16 kilometers and uh, the metal is, is carried in a white schist and it tends to outcrop along the ridges of these valleys that, that run off the Brooks Range. So we'll be doing a bunch of exploratory drilling here. The main focus is to try to si show the size and scope of this deposit. Uh, just a couple pictures to show you where we're working. Um, this uh, is the Southwest Sun deposit here. Um, and now I'm standing on the Southwest Sun looking at the main Sun deposit. And uh, Picnic Creek just sits up over top of the ridge. Um, I can tell you this is a wonderful deposit but it's more important for others to do that. And, and this slide uh, was done by Metal Economics Group and Nova Gold about five and a half years ago. And that's back when Nova Gold owned Nova Copper. 
and they talked about their deposit. They, they called it the Ambler, which is a little bit of a misnomer. It's actually the Arctic deposit. But they talked about it as being one of the largest, if not the largest, undeveloped VMS deposit in the world. And ours was down here. Uh, we've more than doubled the number of drill holes and we've expanded its size. So I, I guess the most important thing to get out of this slide is if you take the Arctic deposit, our deposit, and the Schmucker deposit owned by Tech, this is by far the largest undeveloped district in the world today. And that's why the state is looking at putting access into here. Uh, I just want to give you a little bit of, of history. This, this was a um, uh, pre-feasibility study done by Anaconda. Now, it's before uh, National Policy 43-101 came out, so you're not allowed to rely on these resources. Um, but I can tell you that it was done by Kilbourne Engineering, Swan Wooster, and Canadian Mine Services, very large corporations. And they were talking about 20 million tons, and this works out to about 6% copper equivalent. I had mentioned before Governor Sean Purnell, and the governor has been funding all of the road work uh, for the last two years, and again this year. They initially looked at six routes of access into this district. We have then been going through hearings, and this little picture will show you some of the hearings that Nova Copper, ourselves, and the Transportation Department for the Ministry are going to. And uh, what the natives are doing is deciding where they'd like their access. And the, the route that they've chosen is off of the Dollarton Highway or the Prudhoe Hall Road. And it literally runs right through the middle of our camp. Uh, so we're getting pretty lucky with that. That uh, offloads that capital cost and makes our project pretty interesting to others. Um, you know, many people say that uh, these projects are going to be acquired. I can assure you we've already had numerous offers. Uh, it's a pricing issue. And uh, typically, resources trade at somewhere between 2 and 8% of embedded metal base in the ground. Those percentages vary based on access, grade, political safety, jurisdiction, et cetera. But even if you just took 2%, our stock should be at about $2.40 on this project alone. Uh, if you took 4%, which is mid-ground, you're talking about a stock that should be well over $5. So just an indication of uh, sometimes uh, public value is slightly different than the parts, and you can sell the parts off for a lot more than the, than the uh, total uh, value of the company. And again, just to show you that the majors were active in this, we're extremely active. So uh, we will have this moved along very, very quickly this year. Um, to jump from Alaska, uh, and I should say that we, uh, we paid $13 million as a company to acquire this asset back when copper was 65 cents a pound. So it gives you an idea on what we think uh, the value uh, should be. Um, currently, I think our market cap is around 28 million, so it's just an indication of the, of the, of the discrepancy in value uh, today. Utah, slightly differently. Um, we're the third largest private landholder in the state of Utah. We own the surface and underground rights for, this, for these properties. Uh, if you take out the LDS Church and the, and, and the government, we're the third largest. We have over 18,000 acres, so it's a very significant land holding. Um, it was held by the same and, and has been held since the 1870s um, by a company uh, called Chief Consolidated Mining Company. And unfortunately, Chief had uh, the Superfund show up in the 2001-2002 time frame. And a producing uh, gold mine quickly shut down when a $60 million fine was levied against the company. I can tell you at the end of the day, uh, estimates are well upwards of close to $190 million spent on actually reclamating the property. After three and a half years of work with the EPA and negotiated settlement, they're gone. We have uh, three payments left of 225,000 a year. So it was a huge undertaking to, uh, to move that forward. You know, you find metal where metal's been found before, and this district's been pro uh, extremely prolific. It's uh, produced 270 million ounces of silver, billions of pounds of lead, zinc, and copper, and 2.7 million ounces of gold. And most of these mines mine to the water table, over 23 producing mines in this district. A couple things I'd like to point out. We're 40 miles away from Bingham Canyon. And why is that important? Well, Bingham is the largest open pit mine in the world. Now, Grassburg's uh, volume of pit is larger, but this has produced more metal. It's been an open pit since 1906. Um, I believe at this point in time, with the wall pushback they're doing, it'll be an open pit till past 2034. Uh, but Kennecott Rio Tinto has already drilled enough ore forward that they have 100 years ahead on resources and they still haven't found the bottom of the pit. Um, now, why is that important? Well, we have a joint venture with Rio Tinto. Uh, our ground is very similar uh, to um, theirs. If you, if you plotted uh, Bingham, it would sit approximately here. 
And uh, I should say, just, just for, for knowledge, um, Bingham produces 21% of U.S. copper annually, 23% of its moly, 10% uh, of its silver, and 7% of its gold. So this is an extremely prolific mine. Um, this is Freeport Moran's ground down here. There's also a uh, large porphyry that's been discovered here. Uh, unfortunately, it's too deep and the grade is too low, but it's over a billion tons of about 0.25 copper. Um, our ground is very similar, by the way, to Bingham. Very, very high-grade silver lead zinc mines and a halo around a blank center. And that blank center happens to be a lithocap. That's a dome that's been pushed up on a quartz vein system. It's called telescoping. Uh, world experts believe there's probably a major porphyry here, and so does Rio. Uh, our agreement with Rio is we are fully carried to the end of bankable feasibility study on 45%. At that point in time, we have a put to them, and the put is at a discounted uh, fair value, and we get to take cash or stock, our choice. Uh, and we have the choice on that put. Now, that talks about the center of our ground, and uh, some of the things they've done since this was completed. We finished with the EPA. Uh, and, and had them finally bless us and leave in uh, June timeframe of 210. So since then, Rio Tinto has done 800 kilometers of airborne, 155 seismic shots, 30 kilometers of deep IP. They're finishing up their second deep hole today. So these are deep targets, you know, four or 5,000 foot targets, $2 million holes. Uh, they're bringing in Dr. Dick Silito uh, shortly, who is the world expert. Uh, Rio has told us they'll be bringing him in to analyze where they're at with the program and then reevaluating where we drill and what targets we go after. But I can tell you the geophysics and geochem identified uh, 29 potential targets. Uh, six of them were considered of uh, potentially the right size and depth. I think they're looking for over a billion tons of 1% copper equivalent. And um, uh, 13 were considered kind of mid-grade targets and six, uh, 10 were considered too small. What are we doing? Well, we've been moving forward on a, what we call the Bergen Complex. And uh, this is a complex that was mined by Kennecott for approximately 20 years. It's very high grade silver lead zinc deposit. Uh, and we have completed a PEA on a small portion of the complex. The complex has been estimated at approximately 20 to 40 million tons. But we had enough drill holes into this deposit, which is only 2.3 million tons, to do a PEA. Uh, the numbers look good. Um, we're running approximately uh, eight ounce silver and about uh, uh, in, the, in the neighborhood of 19% uh, lead zinc. Uh, now what does that do in terms of values? Well, if you use 1750 silver, 76 cent lead and 70 cent zinc, um, this shows a cash flow over six years of 278 million. Cost of putting it into production about 100 million. But if you use 5% increased on, uh, on, or 30% increase on cost, so you're up around 21, 22 bucks silver, it brings in almost 500 million. If you use current values, it's about a billion dollars back on 100 in. Um, we, uh, we have serious interest in uh, people joint venturing this and putting it into production and we'd be carried. Uh, our agreements with Rio uh, state that we have to take anything that we're going to do to Rio they have a right of first refusal on it, uh, so we'll be doing that shortly. I can't give any more direction than that than to say that others are pretty interested in what we're doing here. Um, we also have a little gold mine that's uh, bonded and permitted. Uh, we have a mill in place. Uh, it's in pretty good shape. As a matter of fact, when the EPA showed up and shut things down, they still hadn't uh, started using the cyanide circuits. They'd only been producing for about five months, and uh, they were producing out of a chute over here on the left side of the slide, uh, Kennecott had mined this for about 20 years and we're producing about 0.2 ounces of gold per ton, about 8 ounces of silver, and at the bottom of the shaft about 3% copper. Um, when this was being mined by Chief uh, over the five or six month period with low recoveries, which should increase quite significantly uh, as the cyanide circuits come on, um, they were recovering approximately 0.72 ounces of gold per ton. So uh, very low cash costs. If we put this back into production, this will get shifted probably up to about six or 700 bucks an ounce um, because we do some plant expansion underground development. However, with the work that we're doing on our JV today, we may not put this back into production. It may be part of a package that we're dealing on as we speak. So I uh, just wanted to show a little bit of work we have been doing. All this concentrate was sitting here 
um, had been in the concentrating tanks, and when they shut the plant down, they literally walked away. They dumped the pregnant solutions into the initial tailings ponds, which we've cleaned up and, and got ready to go, and this stuff is running anywhere from 0.12 to 0.2 ounces of gold per ton. Okay, just in summary. Um, it's tough out there right now for mining companies. There's absolutely no question it's tough. Couple things that we think differentiate us. We're not a producer, so producers have lots of cash flow. Uh, we, we don't have that. So what differentiates us? Well, number one, uh, we've got a deep pocketed partner in Sentient that uh, has publicly stated they want to go to 19.9% of the stock. Uh, my family has about 18 million in this thing, so we have significant holdings. We have the cash in the bank to do the work programs we're working on now. And we've showed that we can do pretty smart joint ventures. The deal with Rio Tinto is a pretty good deal, pretty good joint venture. We're very close on our silver lead zinc complex. Um, Alaska, the guys are knocking on our door every day. It's just timing. So I think that the, that the, that the model that we have is one that we can make successful. And, and I can tell you that uh, when I started the first competitive phone company in the United States back in 84, people thought I was crazy, but I was able to sell that for multiple billions of dollars, and I've done that a number of times in my career. So we know what we're doing, we know how to run businesses, and uh, the assets are certainly here. Alaska is equivalent of a six million ounce gold deposit today, and rich, not low grade, rich. Utah likewise, massive returns for very little capital expenditure. Um, the one wild card in Utah is water, and that's what we're meeting the governor on last week. We have lots and lots and lots of water that's structurally controlled on this district. Water is a huge, huge problem in Utah. They're out of water. All water is appropriated by the state. Um, we have a resource that will become very, very, very valuable over time. We have approximately 458 years worth of water uh, at uh, 12,000 gallons a minute. So we have a lot of water that's structurally controlled. So we intend to spin that into a separate company we intend to manage that separately from the mining company and dividend it out to our shareholders. So that's, um, that's a quick look at where we're at. I very much appreciate you having me and I'm uh, very open to answer any questions. Gord, um, could you uh, give us a sense of what your gut sense is on timing for that road development into Ambler? Well, the best way I can do that is, is to quote what uh, Governor Parnell said last year when he, when he talked to the Chamber of Commerce in Anchorage, and he said he wanted the road completed in five years. So this is, this is happening fairly quickly. They've been funding the costs. Uh, it's third year of doing it at the permitting stage now and final design stage. So, uh, and you can go online. If you go to the Alaska Transportation Department, uh, you can go online, you can see the studies. Uh, I can't carry them, they're, they're too big to bring to a conference, but uh, you can certainly go online and see all that. And that's what, uh, that's what drives interest in, in an area like this. And uh, this is all about, uh, because it's a copper equivalent uh, district or copper district, this is all about copper in the ground. And to quote uh, Kaplan and Van Nieuwenhuis in their last uh, news release, this is the richest, largest undeveloped district in the world today. Yes, sir. So how much money do you need to define a resource uh, at your Alaskan asset? Yeah. Um, we have, uh, uh, when we finish this year on the main sun and the southwest sun, I will expend another $3 million this year. At that point, we'll be at the PEA level. So that, that has really defined that deposit as far as we need to take it in order to sell it. Um, part of why we're doing some step-out exploratory work is sometimes you can be a little quick on the draw, and I'd like to see what else is on the property and what the upside potential is before we do that. But yes, we'll be once you get to the PEA level, you can start joint venturing. and like that's what we're doing down in Utah. Uh, I can also tell you, you know, when you're, when you're just generally talking about things, um, I would suggest that you go to Rio Tinto's website and see if you can find a bunch of joint ventures they do with juniors. They buy juniors, but they typically don't go in and spend all the exploratory money to carry juniors on a piece of property they own. 
And that's usually a pretty good indication of what they believe the potential of the property is. Whether they find anything or not is another story. But they certainly think there's tremendous potential there. We put zero value on that because they haven't found anything. But if they do find something, um, the sky is the limit in terms of, you know, you start producing a few billion dollars a year like Bingham Canyon, the upside potential is just astronomical. Well, I thank you very much for waiting uh, to listen to me at the end of the day. It's a pleasure to be here. Thank you.